everybody kevin flanagan here with the brand academy what i wanted to do tonight is just a short addendum or follow-up to the video that i uploaded last week a story of an irish sept chapter one dealing with the origins of a famous irish sept the dalcassians this was written by nottage charles mcnamara and there are some points that came up in the comments that i felt it was worth going into in a little bit more detail so this is the book here. If anybody is interested in reading it, you can download it from the brehenacademy.org website. The story of an Irish sept, their character, and struggle to maintain their lands in Clare, written by a member of the sept. I want to just point out again, I know I mentioned it in the previous video, but I think it's important to remember that this book was published in 1896. So the information that um, not that had to come to his conclusions was quite limited. There was no internet. Um, genealogical research was nowhere near advanced as it is now. What this book or the story of an Irish sept covers is really the, the history of Ireland, but focusing on a single clan. And that's why I find it incredibly interesting. This book could be written about any Irish clan pretty much and their struggle to maintain their lands. But we're dealing with the McNamara clan who are descended from the Dalcassians, of which the O'Briens are also a, a clan or a member of that sept. So we're looking at this territory here, which is in the west of Ireland in County Clare, also known as Tomond, which means the Kingdom of North Munster. Uh, to guide us on this, I'd like to refer back to a couple of the comments that were left on the video, because that should give us some insight of where I'd like to go with this uh, addendum. So Matt Potter, thanks for your comment, Matt. Um, just in the middle paragraph there, Matt says that he's not watched the channel for a while, but he wonders what the latest genetic studies have to bring over the Basques and the Irish from County Clare, and especially the Aran Islands. Is this link confirmed? I might have to rewatch some videos around this after to reacquaint myself with this topic, because as far as I can remember, there wasn't much evidence at that time which is not to say there won't be any in the future in a later comment matt also added that as for the dna link to the basque country i think i saw that somewhere not too long ago i had referred to him um, an rte documentary covering this some years ago but i wasn't able to find it again and i'm not sure if that was positive negative or just raised more questions i think it may have been the latter but i'm not sure and then Ossery Overseas left a really interesting comment as well. And he commented on how not to Charles McNamara seemed to be very fixated on what was considered science of the era um, in which it was published, 1896, phrenology and the late 19th century comparisons of races and nations, especially within Europe. You can see McNamara reacting to what other English and German authors were saying as he uses such methods to defend the honor and history of his own people, while now all such thinking is long discredited. As you said at the start, this has value as a relic of its own day. And I'll probably repeat that throughout this whole series. We must really treat the work in the context of the time that it was written. It's an amazing thing to see the Irish grapple with a history which is both heroic, juxtaposed with military and political subjugation. This combination of a society broken but still clinging on and he has it cleverly marked out and of a distant glorious past, but keenly remembered is, I think, why those in Ireland and of Irish descent wrestle with such a love of history. And this is an interesting point that I'd like to go into and I will go into shortly, particularly around the idea of phrenology. But what this conversation really raises for us is the question of who were the fear bullocks? The fear bullocks are mentioned by uh, McNamara throughout the text and this is who he believes he is descended from but who were the fear bullocks it's an interesting question I took a little snippet from Wikipedia there I know Wikipedia is not the fountain of knowledge when it comes especially to things of ancient Ireland but it does give a good um, sort of mainstream view uh, the fear bollocks in medieval Irish myth uh, were the fourth group of people to settle in Ireland the fourth group they are descended from the Muncha Nemed, or the Nemedian people, that means, uh, an earlier group who abandoned Ireland and went to different parts of Europe. Those who went to Greece became the Freer Bullock, 
and eventually returned to Ireland after it had been uninhabited for many years. After ruling it for some time and dividing the island into provinces, they are overthrown by the invading Tuatha de Danann. So what we're talking about here are the early migrations of people to Ireland. When you look at Irish mythology, particularly the Book of Invasions, it's called the Book of Invasions, but also called the Book of the Taking of Ireland. Um, and what this book basically contains is the stories of the migrations of different people into Ireland. So it's not a question in the mind of the Irish psyche that there are migrants who came to Ireland, different migrations who settled here at different times, who had different characteristics, who uh, eventually warred with one another for uh, ownership and, and dominance on the island. I'd like to go a little bit deeper into this, though. Um, some of the source material that I'm talking about here comes from Geoffrey Keating's History of Ireland, but other sources as well, particularly the Book of Invasions, as I mentioned. When you look into these genealogies, one of the interesting stories, let me go this way. One of the interesting stories about the Firbolgs was that they were inhabiting Ireland. They were ruling Ireland. Um, the only other kind of significant group of people who were there at the time were called the Fomorians. And these are even less are known of the Fomorians. And in many respects, they could be described as the, the, the true native inhabitants of Ireland. But they're always depicted as being kind of like they're like the Titans like the bad gods, if you want, the monstrous ones who come from the sea. They live on the island of um, Inish Tori Tor, uh, in Tormor. This is where the, 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 the clan or the, the group of people from whom Balor of the evil eye descends. And they're always at the backdrop of Irish mythology, these Fomorian type. Um, with the fear bollocks, they inhabited Ireland and they later had to face another migration that came after them, which were the two had done it. And this picture that you can see on the left here is of two members of these two groups of people, the two had the Danon and the fear bollocks. They're ambassadors for each of these groups. They're called Srang, uh, who was of the fear bollock, and Bress, who was of the two had the Danon. And I remember reading about this story many, many years ago when I was younger. And uh, one of the things that really struck me in the story, how it says they approached each other quite guarded, you know, uh, these two ambassadors were sent to meet and they could speak the same language. And when they met and discovered they could speak the same language, one of the first things that they inquired of each other is of their race and people from whom did they descend? What stock were they from? What is their race essentially? And this was always a mystery for me for a while. Like, how could they speak the same language, the Tua, the Danon, and the Fear Bollocks? That just makes no sense. But it made sense when I did some more deeper research when I was a little bit older and realized that the story goes that they are themselves two groups that are descended from a, an original group called the Nemedians, the, the Muncher Nemed, as it's mentioned there on the Wikipedia page. And this goes some way to explaining why and how they were able to speak the same language. Um, the other picture there is the first battle of Moitora, which I will get to in just a second. But what I wanted to do is just go a little bit deeper onto the fear books, because there are different sources for these stories and the different sources tell different accounts and have different explanations for these things. Um, as I mentioned, there are the, the book of invasions, um, which talks about this, but uh, O'Rahilly, Theo Rahilly, he talks about it as well. He he um, seems to think that they are the the fear bollocks are like a pre-Celtic p uh, a pre-Celtic group uh, that came to Ireland before the Celts, and a lot of the early writers tend to talk of them as being real. Although accepting that um, there's a lot of mythology tied into this and it's really difficult to know what is the point where mythology ends and history begins. So in the Lower Gavala era, in the Book of the Takings of Ireland, it talks about Ireland being settled by six different groups of people. Uh, the first three people are the people of Caser or Caser, um, who allegedly is a, a granddaughter of Noah. Then you have the people of Partholon, 
uh, and then the people of Nemed, who I've just mentioned. Um, the people of Nemed were wiped out by some sort of a plague or they had battles with the Fomorians and they had to flee the island. And when they fled the island, some of them went, um, well, the groups of people went to different parts of Europe. The fear bullocks are said to have been the ones who went to Greece. And while they were in Greece, they were not treated very well. This is how one of the stories goes. Um, within the fear bullock, there's actually three groups. You could say there's three subgroups that are called fear bullocks. Um, there's also the fear downland and the fear galleon. OK, but they're all supposed to be connected as the same kind of wider kin group. What we call them the fear volux collectively. Um, and there's a reason why some people, well, Jeffrey Keating gives a reason why they're called this. And I'll get to that in a second. But even the word fear bullock is something that there's even contention over that. Some people say that it's like uh, the men of the belly, bullock being your belly and fear being the Irish for, for men. So fear bullock, the men of the belly. But other people suggest that it's the men of the bag, the bag men. And this is supported by Keating um, in his analysis of these words. So the idea was that basically the fear bullocks ended up being sort of slaves while they were in Greece. And these groups, they're broken into three groups. There were the men in the bag, the men of the earth, the downland, and the men of this spear, spear, uh, the Gallion. And the idea was that the, the fair downland were the ones who were digging the soil, this fertile soil up in the mountains. The fair bullocks were the ones who were collecting that soil in the bags and bringing it down into the city to be used. And the fair Gallion were the ones who had spears who were protecting them while they were doing this. But who knows? Who knows, really? Um, we just cannot divorce our understanding of early Irish psyche and identity without taking account of these pseudo-historical, semi-mythological um, uh, stories. So coming back to Kassair, why is that interesting? Well, to say that she is the descendant of a daughter of Noah, the Book of Invasions, the Laura Gaval and uh, Aaron, is generally considered to be like not historical. And it's kind of criticized as an attempt by early Irish monks to write the Irish, the Gale, into the story of man in a biblical context. So putting the Irish man, the Gale, into certain uh, situations that we're now being accepted across the Christianized Europe as being like the true history of the world. And therefore, Kassar is described as being a daughter of, of Noah. Now, what happened with Noah? There was the Great Flood, right? So um, Kassar and her followers of, I think, gosh, it must have been like 60 people or 90 people, something like that. Three men and the rest were all women. They get in a boat and they sail to Ireland. And they are eventually wiped out by the flood, all of them, except for Finton, who takes the form of a fish and survives the flood. And he's the one who lives to tell the story. So we have this really kind of mishmash here of like biblical references, um, um, the, the great flood, for example, and um, the early idea of like the, the Celtic, I don't like even to say Celtic and because of this sort of research, it's hard to say Celtic, but the early Gaelic, early Irish um, psyche and mythology, the idea of shape-shifting, the salmon, the salmon of knowledge, these kind of early motifs start to take, um, start to show up here. So Kassar was the first group of people. There's also Partholon, who I won't go into now. Um, actually, if you want to learn more about this, I have a video on YouTube, the, the mythic origins of the Irish people. I think that's what it's called. Um, if you type in mythic origins, you'll find it uh, on my channel. And this that that video is quite long. I think it's about it's over an hour long and it goes into each of these groups of people and tells their story. So you can definitely go into more information over there. But Nemed is an interesting one to focus on for a second here, because Nemed is a word that continued all through um, the 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 Irish era, the, the, the age, the Gaelic age, which I count up to being around the 1600s. Um, Nemed was a word that was used for the nobility. 
than the med. And therefore, we have this um, uh, uh, tract of Brehan law called the Brehan Nemed, which are the judgments of the nobles. So Nemed was seen to be uh, some sort of mythological progenitor of groups of people who at one point fled Ireland. Some of them went to Greece. I'm trying to recall where did the two had the Danon go. I think it might have been like Scandinavian countries. I'll have to, maybe it will come back to me. But the Nemed went to Greece. Oh, sorry, the, the fear bollocks, the people who would become the fear bollocks went to Greece. And after being treated there so badly for so long, they, they decided to leave and return back to their land of Ireland from where, in their mind, their ancestors had come from. Their ancestors came from Ireland in their mind, even though Nemed himself was uh, one of these migrations. So it's not easy. It's not an easy topic. There's a lot of like moving parts here. It's... um. It's naughty, it's complicated. We don't have a lot of like very strong sources, but there's definitely references to this all throughout our, our mythological cycle of our manuscripts. Um, so yeah, those who went to Greece became the fear bollocks. They were enslaved by the Greeks, as I said, and they returned uh, back, to, back to Ireland. So um, this brings us up to what I was speaking about a few moments ago. They've settled in Ireland. I believe that the Fear Bullocks had uh, nine kings of Ireland. And the last uh, of the, of the uh, Fear Bullock high kings was uh, Yuki Makarok. Yuki Makarok. And he was, um, or Yuchid, he was the, the high king at the time when the uh, Tua had the Danon came. And even though they recognized that they had this like, lineage um they are kind of like distant cousins somehow they could speak the same language they both descended from the med um it was kind of certain that they were going to have a battle um i believe the legend tells that the two of the danon asked for some like compromise from yukut uh like half of the island or something and he said like no we will not give them half because if we give them half they will surely take the rest of it too so this led to the first battle of Moitora, it's called um, uh, Akha Maktora. Uh, that might not be the best pronunciation in the Irish, but um, the battle of Moitora, the first battle. And this is what we see depicted in the artwork here of Jim Fitzpatrick. Jim Fitzpatrick, I think, is one of the best artists for producing like materials about early Irish mythology. They're just quite beautiful and amazing to look at and have this very like flavor of... Uh, this very Gaelic Irish flavor to them. So what happened was the battle began and um, each day they sent nine groups of nine hurlers each. I should say before the battle, like in this picture, what's happening is they're inspecting each other's weapons. So they were allowed, each side was allowed to inspect each other's weapons to, I guess, make sure that they had weapons that were of sufficient like quality and the technology was the same. Um, and they sent the same amount of people to battle each day in this battle of Moitora. And that's why on the image there on the right, you see that they have hurls. And that's literally what the legend says, that they sent nine groups of nine hurlers each day to battle. So they battle with hurls. And it's a fantastic story. And if you're interested in Irish mythology, I would really recommend to go back and uh, have a look at that because it's just, it's a great story. And um how it ended was that the two of the Danon won, but the, the battle itself is full of magic. It has druids. It has um, amazing, amazing story to it, where even uh, it tells how Nuada, the king of the two of the Danon, lost his arm in battle and would later become Nuada and Argotlov, the Nuada of the Silver Hand. Um, so, yeah, this cannot be divorced from our history, our idea of Irish psyche and his and um, uh, um uh, mentality our sense of ourselves and it should be said that like there have been more kind of um let's say evidence-based research away from the mythology that tries to understand what is going on with all of this with all of these stories um and again uh, tf o'rahilly in his early irish history and mythology that was published in 1946 he attempts to make a connection with the belgae uh, tribe who were tribes living in northern Gaul and um, so some people I guess like uh, Arahali is in is in this camp as well 
Um, well, some people suggest that they're named from a fictional race, and some people suggest that they're a real group of people and could be connected to the Belgae of Northern Gaul. And um, there's actually a lot of places in Ireland that have names that relate to these groups of people: the Fir Bullock, the Fir Downland, and the Fir Gallian. Um, that lead some archaeologists i guess to believe that they must have been real groups of people but to what extent and what influence they had on the people it's it's really hard it's really hard to say um so that's just a little bit of the background on the fear of bullocks um what i'd like to do next is just keeping in mind what we covered in the previous um in the previous uh video where we read the first chapter I'd like to read this. Um, it's another extract from Of the Ancient Races of Ireland by Lady Francesca Wilde. And just see if you can draw any parallels here from what has already been covered. And this is probably the sort of material that Nottage Charles McNamara had access to when he was writing. So she says the earliest historic race of Ireland was a pastoral people called the Fir Bullocks, said to be of Greek or Eastern origin, probably a branch of that great Celtic race which having passed through Europe and round its shores, found a resting place at last in Ireland. Of the Fomorians, Nemedians, and other minor invaders, we need not speak, as they have left nothing by which to track their footsteps. The old analysts bring them direct from the Ark and in straight line from Japheth. The coming of Pharaoh's daughter from Egypt with her ships may be also considered apocryphal. Here they're talking about Skota which I mentioned in the previous video as well. Uh, but the fair balls begin our authentic history. They had laws and social institutions and established a monarchical government at the far famed Hill of Tara, about which our early centers of civilization sprung and where we have now most of the, those great pasture lands, those plains of Meath that can beat the world for their fattening qualities and which supply neighboring countries with their most admired meats. I cannot say that the Fearbulg was a cultivated man, but I think he was a shepherd and an agriculturist. I doubt if he knew anything, certainly not much of metallurgy, but it does not follow that he was a mere savage, no more than the Maoris of New Zealand were when we first came into contact with them. This kind of relates to what um, McNamara is talking about in relation to the early graves that were found and how very few metal artifacts were being found in these graves which is how why and how he makes a distinction between this group of people whoever they were and the later invasions who we call celts but we're going to see um shortly that that might not be their uh, accurate either um the fear bulgs were a small straight haired swarthy race who have left a portion of their descendants with us to this very day a genealogist their own countryman resident in Galway about 200 years ago, described them as dark haired, dark haired, talkative, guileful, strolling, unsteady, quote, disturbers of every council and assembly, end quote, and described, um, and described formed the bulk of our so-called Celtic population. Ah, sorry. And promoters of discord. Sorry. So they were disturbers of every council and assembly and promoters of discord. I believe they, together with the next two races about to be described, formed the bulk of our so-called Celtic population, combative, nomadic, and um, opportunity, enduring, uh, litigious, but feudal and faithful to their chiefs, hardworking for a spurt, as in their annual English emigration, not thrifty, but when their immediate wants are supplied, Lazy, especially during the winter. To these physical and mental characters described by McFurtivus, let me add those of the unusual combination of blue or blue-gray eyes and dark eyelashes with a swarthy complexion. This peculiarity I have only remarked elsewhere in Greece. In Greece. The mouth and upper gum is not good, but the nose is usually straight. In many of this and the next following race, there was, there was a peculiarity that has not been alluded to by writers. The larynx, or as it used to be called, the pomum adami, was remarkably prominent and became more apparent from the uncovered state of the neck. 
The sediment of this early people still exists in Ireland, along with the fair-complexioned Danans, and forms the bulk of the farm labourers, called in popular phraseo phraseology sa spalpines, spalpines, that yearly emigrate to England. In Connacht, they now chiefly occupy a circle which includes the junctions of the counties Mayo, Galway, Roscommon, and Sligo. And I'm surprised she doesn't include Claire here, but however, they, with their fair-faced brothers, at present the most numerous, are also to be found in Kerry and Donegal, and they nearly all speak Irish. By statistics procured from our great Midland Western Railway alone, I learned that on average 30,000 of these people, chiefly the descendants of the Dark Frillbulgs and the Fair Danons, emigrate annually to England to harvest for harvest work, to the great advantage of the English farmer and the Irish landlord. The acreage of arable land for these people runs from two to six acres. Connecting this race with the remains of the past, I am of the opinion that they were the first wrath or earthen mound and enclosure makers, that they mostly buried their dead without cremation, and in cases of distinguished, distinguished personages, beneath the cromlech or the tumulus, their heads were oval or long in the antero, antero posterior diameter and rather flattened at the sides. Examples of these I have given and the discounted upon when I first published my ethnological researches, ethnological researches, uh, which have been fully confirmed by the late Andreas Retzius. It is, however, unnecessary, even if space or advisability permitted for me to allude to such matters as that great work, the Crania Britannica, has lithographed typical specimens of this long-headed race. Apologies for the few slips of the tongue there. Um, but I wanted to share this with you just to show you that what we're reading about from McNamara is not in isolation. It seems that uh, especially writers of that era within like the past hundred years or so um, seem to generally hold on to this idea that the, the fear bollocks were a distinct group of people in Ireland and they were characterized by the darkness of their hair a shorter build, uh, blue eyes, and other characteristics, um, particularly regarding their character and personality, which we'll talk about shortly. Just as a little aside here to emphasize um, this point, uh, I once, uh, once dated a girl from uh, Kerry who looked like this, who had these features, and so much so that her father was nicknamed the Spaniard. Um, so there are certainly a, a kind of a genetic group of people in Ireland who have these sort of features that we would consider um, more Iberian or closer to the Basque. I would say that there are generally speaking three like core groups of typical Irish looking people. We do have blonde haired, blue eyed uh, Irish people, um, often green eyed as well, which come from um, the, the Danish invasions. We also have these like dark haired, blue eyed, darker skinned, uh, fair, um, darker complexion, which perhaps come from the, um, the Basques and the Iberian Peninsula. And then we have the more kind of generic idea of the Irish person who has the red hair and the freckles. So there are certainly different distinctive groups within Ireland that have different genetic makeup. And these writers are trying with the limited resources they have available to them to try and make sense of that. The next thing I wanted to talk about very briefly here was the topic of phrenology. I don't want to dwell on this too much, um, but just as it was mentioned in the comments, I don't believe that um, the writers are talking about phrenology when they talk about the shapes of the skulls. Phrenology is a, is a completely outdated um, scientific idea if you can even call it scientific, um, that believe that you could tell the character of a person and their, yeah, their characteristics and traits by the different bumps on their head. Um, to me, this looks a lot like palmistry and palm reading. Um, it's been pretty much completely discredited. It is completely discredited. What am I saying? Pretty much. It is completely discredited. But that's not the same as saying that 
it's possible. It's not even controversial within forensic science to suggest that it's possible to identify different groups of people, races of people through the shapes of their skull. Uh, here I just pulled up one scientific paper that discusses this. And I have a picture there showing the, the different types of skulls from different core kind of racial groups in, in uh, the world. And this has got nothing to do with racial superiority or anything like that. And there was some comments in the chat room last time that were just kind of way off the mark, in my opinion. And it has nothing to do with racial superiority. It's just acknowledging the fact that different races look different from each other. And it's as simple as that. Um, whether you can say within, like we can see the ca uh, Caucasian uh, school there on the on the right, the European school, whether those people in 1896 had enough knowledge and understanding of the science of the shape of crania to say that European skulls could be distinguished one from another, like a German skull can be distinguished from that of an Irishman. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I can't say anything on that. But I don't think it's... Um, too far-fetched based on the information that they had to or maybe far-fetched isn't the right word i don't i think it's with the information that they had available to them it's reasonable to to to, to see why they would look to this sort of research um for indicators of of um their kind of genetic lineage but today we have much much more advanced DNA research, genetic um, uh, science that allows us to not only look at different sort of uh, physical characteristic traits that are different, but also we can track it in the, uh, in the chromosomes, in the Y chromosome and the uh, mitochondrial DNA. We can see where, from where we descend. Um, and what's interesting, just quickly on this point, when, if anybody has done these like 21andMe um tests where you can take a swab and send it off and they show you where you come from a lot of people find out that they're actually a little bit of everything a little bit of this and a little bit of that so what that shows us is that our ancestors got around didn't they and that was surely the case in in early ireland so to what extent you can talk about um uh, pure race of fear bullocks or celts and so on is very questionable and i don't even know how how valuable it is but I really want to emphasize here that I believe McNamara is not using this as his like fundamental basis for his claim. His claim being that the people of West, West of Ireland and Cork, oh, sorry, County Clare and the Aran Islands um, descend or have genetic connection to the people of the Basque of Spain. He uses the skulls as just one example here, but he also uses other examples. For example, for example, he says um, he uses a linguistic example. So Professor Boyd Dawkins observes that Erin, Ireland, the land of Erna, Ivernian, Ibernian, and I would add Hibernia, is merely a variant of Iberia. And that the name of the great island of the Western Ocean, Ireland, and the southwestern peninsula of Europe, which is the Basque country, is due to their having been occupied by the same race, a race so clearly marked off from all the others as to be known by the same name. And he doesn't just focus on the skulls. He also talks about the general characteristics, physical characteristics of these people. Um, tradition refers to this race as having been rather under the average height, short, with brown or gray eyes and curly dark hair a type to be found in considerable numbers among the people of Clare at the present day. He also says that the ancient inhabitants of Ireland from the earliest times were recognized as Iberians. And as we learn from the life of St. Shannon, were known in central Clare as the Baskin tribe. The Baskin tribe. Maybe it's connected to the people of the Basque region. Basque country. Uh, I also seen in the comments, and we will talk about this uh, in a moment. Actually, I can show you the slide now, and I'm going to read this article uh, in more detail later on. Uh, Galicia. Galicia is quite similar in sound to like Gaelic, right? The, the Gaelic people, the Galician people. 
the people of West uh, of, of Clare being called the Baskin tribe, Basque region. I'm not going to read this now, um, but it did feature in the previous video. I'm going to read this for you uh, at the end of this short presentation that I have. Uh, McNamara also includes the observations of the third Earl of Carnarvon, who spent time with the Basques. And his reason for including this is to not talk about the physical characteristics here, but to talk about the personality traits. What type of people were these Basques? And in what way are they likened to the people of Ireland, particularly those of Clare, McNamara's tribe? Uh, so some of the observations of the third Earl of Carnarvon I've included here. Every man had a right to state his own case before constituted authorities when accused or as defendant, and that this was a far more precious, uh, this right was far more precious than even the habeas corpus. What we're hinting at here is the importance of law, even in an ancient time. The Earl of Carnarvon also talked about how um, the Basques were incredibly protective of their ancient furors, was the word, which are their ancient rights. They inhabited a free land and were men deserving free freedom. The whole bearing of the men spoke of liberty long enjoyed, well understood, and therefore not abused. They were trained to habits of self-reliance by centuries of self-government fine men in spirit, not in name alone, drinking in with their mother's milk a love of justice and a reverence for law. So can you see here, in, well, in my opinion, this is McNamara's effort to make this more fundamental connection between the very nature of the Irish and the Basques. In thought sober, yet independent and wholly without fear, except the honest fear of doing wrong. Models of ancient manners and not unfrequently of manly beauty, faithful friends and generous hosts. They adhere with tenacity to the soil of their birth. No prospect of advantage or promotion can induce him to abandon his home. And as we see, as we go throughout this text, the story of an Irish sept, the story of Ireland becomes very, uh, gets brought very clearly into focus. And you realize just how sad it is. He, writing in 1896, is aware of the fact that this was very much the nature of the early Irish. Their love of justice, their connection to their land, the soil of their birth, and their unwillingness to give it up under any costs. So just to kind of recap the last section here, we're not only talking about the shapes of the skulls, although per perhaps there is some merit to that line of inquiry. We're not talking about phrenology, of not at all, which is the bumps on your head, meaning something like your character or something like that. We're not talking about that. Um, we are, um, I think we can give an allowance to McNamara here in the context of the time that it was written, why he would look to evidence like the shapes of skulls. However, as we'll see shortly, there is now abundant genetic evidence to support these claims as well. But more importantly, and probably the most important part for me is why is he drawing this connection to the Basque and why does he spend so much time on it? It's because he's trying to show the character of the people in this early time. What, what was their nature? Who were they by their nature? They were lovers of justice, lovers of the law. They adhered to their land. They were strong people who the only fear that they had was the fear of doing wrong. Now, I just want to take a little tangent here and talk about who were the Celts. This is not going to be long. I just want to recommend this document, this um uh, seminar uh, by Professor Barry Cunliffe. Um, you can see it's relatively new. It was on St. Patrick's Day 2008. And Professor Barry Cunliffe is probably one of the most, uh, the foremost archaeologists um, of our time. 
And this, this presentation is incredibly interesting because it challenges this idea of what are the Celts and who are they and this kind of um, east to west migration. Um, there's a lot in this presentation that suggests there is a, some elements of west to east migration. But to call this group of people the Celts is kind of um, not helpful or even accurate. Uh, and genetic research is backing up this as well. Because when you say something like, oh, the Celts, you, you create in the mind of the listener the, an idea of a homogenous group of people who had the same culture, the same beliefs, who were essentially the same family, the same tribe, right? But um, what we are finding out through more modern archaeological research and gene uh, genealogical research is that that's not a very helpful phrase and it's not quite entirely accurate. How I like to describe this to people comparatively is to say, well, if you talk about the Europeans, okay, if you were to say, oh, well, the Europeans do X or they behave Y, it's not helpful because European, sure, is a word that we can use to describe the whole group of people who live on the continent of Europe. But within that continent, there are many subgroups, you know, and they're not directly connected to each other, apart from this kind of overarching idea of being European. As such, they speak different language in Germany as they do in France. Very different. They speak, I know that we have Indo-European uh, languages, but the culture and the history and the nature of the people differs in each of these places. So it's not always helpful or accurate to refer to just one group of people as being the Celts. So this is a great docu uh, the seminar that I would, really recommend i'll put a link in the description of this video so you can watch this after but it's very eye-opening and just gives us more information and more of a deeper understanding of how to think about this early time in our history the groups of people that were there and how they migrated and how they interacted with each other so what i'd like to do now is um i'm going to read three articles for you the first article i'm going to read is the one from the Irish Times that I just uh, shared the screenshot with you there a few moments ago. A uh, second article is going to be from Irish Central, which is teasing out this idea of uh, who were the Celts and what is Ireland's like genetic heritage. And the third article then will be from a Basque website, which is also talking about this connection between the Basques and the Irish. The first article I'd like to share with you is from the Irish Times, published February 16, 2009 and written by Dick Alstrom. Genetic studies show how our closest relatives are found in Galicia and the Basque region. Ancestral links. What do pygmy shrews, badgers, mountain hares, pine martens and Irish people have in common? All probably originally came to Ireland on boats from northern Spain. Our closest relatives are found in various parts of Galicia and the Basque Country, according to genetic studies led by Professor Dan Bradley of Trinity College Dublin Smurfit Institute of Genetics. He presented his research over the weekend at the American Association for the Advancement of Science annual meeting in Chicago. He was joined by Queen's University Belfast archaeologist and linguist Professor James Mallory, who talked about efforts to link these DNA studies with the transmission of languages across Western Europe. The chair of the session was the government's chief scientific advisor, Professor Patrick Cunningham. Professor Bradley and colleagues have done extensive genetic analysis into where the Irish came from and how they got to Ireland. He studies genes associated with the Y chromosome, a genetic inheritance that comes via the father. By tracking the presence of certain Y chromosome markers, he can travel back in time to map our relatedness to others across Europe. He explained how he had also done this with the two main species of cattle, the familiar flat-backed cattle and the hump-backed cattle seen in India and Africa. The human data definitely show that our strongest relatedness was with the Northern Iberian Peninsula, with this genetic signal strongest for the Irish living today in the west of Ireland. These in turn were likely the closest relatives of the migrants who originally settled in Ireland. Genetic studies of Irish fauna also showed this distinctive signal. He said, the Irish badgers are Spanish, but the British badgers are not. The fauna of Ireland seems to be divergent. How does one explain this? He asked. The most likely explanation was that 
The island was settled by migrants from northern Spain as the glaciers that covered Ireland from the last ice age melted away. It seems to me that most animals in Ireland came by boat. There seems to have been some communication with southern Europe. The Book of Invasions from the 8th century talked about an invasion by the Spanish king Milesius, he said. His group also looked for genetic linkages between people sharing a common surname, something passed along from the male lineage like the Y chromosome. They found linkages that trace back to the famous O'Neill kindred, from whom Neil Nigalic, Nile of the Nine Hostages, was descended. Professor Mallory described attempts to match up the transmission of languages with the dispersal of DNA as people migrated across Europe. It was extremely difficult, however, due to confounding influences including language transmission via elite dominance. Settled areas with a unique language later taken over by invaders would see language displacement, with the newcomers imposing their own language. However, the local gene pool would remain and would dilute the genetic influence of the newcomers. This was possibly the reason why, when one looked for genetic evidence of the Celts in Ireland, these Celtic genes could not be found. Studies of this dynamic has occurred in what is now Hungary showed a mismatch between the dominant language and the dominant genetic influence. Modern DNA is no predictor of the modern Hungarian language, Professor Mallory said. The next article is from Irish Central. Some myths of the Celt exposed by the science of DNA, written by Michael O'Loughlin, September 25th, 2020. We have been taught for a few generations that the Irish descended from the Celts. The king of one wave of Celts was Milesius. Milesius is the most famous Celt in legend, I think. Some call him the founder of the Irish people, but it looks like it is mostly a fanciful story. DNA studies are now telling us that Ireland was settled centuries earlier than thought. It was not first settled by the Celts of legend. It was actually those who survived the last ice age about 10,000 years ago, holding out in northwest Spain. As things warmed up, they found their way to Ireland. In fact, the closest DNA match with the Irish in all Europe is with the Basque. Take a look at the film Blood of the Irish and you'll become a believer. The current theory is that they came by boat to Ireland, which was settled much later than Britain, which was connected by land to the continent. They did not come from Scotland, but from Basque country. So, at least they came from around Spain, like some of the Milesian legends speak of. We still have to double check all the findings, but it seems pretty convincing. The Irish and the Basque are brothers, so to speak. As far as we can see, our earliest ancestors were the Basque people. So there is the point to start your genealogy in Ireland. If you want to see some of the legends that came from the story of the Celts and Milesius, there is a book it is entitled A Genealogical History of the Milesian Families of Ireland that I published several years ago. If you want to see a real classic, take a look at the Book of Invasions, one of our oldest written stories about who settled Ireland. This book gives that the Irish originally came from Spain. This is the ancient book that O'Donnell took to the court of Spain, trying to strengthen the ties between the two countries. Looks like there was some truth there. And the third article is from a website, aboutbasquecountry.eus. For the Irish, the closest DNA match is with the Basques. The US-based online publication Irish Central, dedicated to the Irish all over the world, has brought back an article on the Basque roots of the Irish, which we ourselves mentioned back in the day. The article, written by Irish genealogy expert Michael O'Loughlin, is based on the DNA studies he's carried out. We've already brought you some of these articles among the topics we've covered on Basque genetics. Curiously, the Irish, the Basques and the Sards make up an unusual triangle of genetic relationships because there are also important genetic connections between the islanders of Sardinia and the original Basque settlers. Perhaps the only thing that might need to be explained to the author of the article, an expert in Irish genealogy, is that being of Basque descent is not the same as descending from the inhabitants of northern Spain. For starters, when this happened, Spain did not exist, while the Basques did. 
but even if rather than Spain he'd meant the Iberian Peninsula, making a geographical rather than political reference, that isn't quite right either. This is because of the fact that the Basques back then, as today, live on both sides of the Pyrenees, meaning some are on the Iberian Peninsula and others on the continental mainland. In any case, it's always a pleasure to find out that a people as pleasant and beloved by the Basques as the Irish have strong connections with our Basque ancestors who colonised Europe after the last Ice Age. So that brings us to the end of this addendum to chapter one of a story of an Irish sept. I don't think I'm going to need to do an addendum or a follow-up for most of the other chapters that are going to be covered. Just this one felt like you needed a little bit more investigation and discussion around it just to clarify and add a little bit of depth to some of the things that uh, the ideas that are brought up by uh, Nottage Charles McNamara in this first chapter um, as we begin this journey of understanding this family, this McNamara clan and their struggle to maintain their lands in County Clare. Um, so I ho really hope you enjoyed this content, this um, addition to chapter one. Uh, I'd love to hear your comments in the comment section below. If you liked the video, please click that little finger button there. Um, if you want to see more of this and get notified when I'm going to be uploading new content, please hit the subscribe button. Also inviting anybody watching this to please go and sign up at thebrehenacademy.org. It's completely free to join. Uh, you can get access to the library. There's a lot of materials there, blog posts, a um, bunch of videos, uh, content that's not always available on YouTube, stuff that I haven't put into video format yet. Um, so if that's your thing, uh, I think you're going to like the website. Big, huge thank you to those of you who bought some stuff from the store in the last uh, last week. Those of you who bought mugs and T-shirts, I really hope you enjoy them. I think they're going to be on the way out to you very soon once they just get printed and shipped. Uh, and a huge thank you to those of you who um, helped me out by, by becoming a paid member. I really appreciate it. it. It's such a confidence boost and it really fuels the work that I'm doing. It, it pushes me on to produce more and more content like this. And it just is really satisfying to know that um, people are getting a value out of this and um, they, they appreciate it. So thank you so much for your support uh, to all of you. Um, I, it really, it really means a lot. Um, I'm almost finished uh, chapter two, which is going to be focusing on uh, the Brehan law, uh, more widely speaking, say like the um, law and society of early Ireland. So we're going to be talking about the Brehan laws, who wrote the Brehan laws, who put them into the manuscripts, let's say, uh, the Shankus Moore, status and society. We even have a little short section on the B judgments, which I know people really like uh, to, to, to hear about. I have a video on YouTube about uh, bees, bees, trees, and Brehan law. So you might like to check that out as well if you can't wait till, I think it's going to be out next week in the next few days, I hope. And if you like this content and you feel like you're getting something from it, I would really encourage you to, to have a look at the courses on brehanacademy.org. Um, that is probably my best work in this on this um, Brehan Academy project. There's a lot of information there in each one of the courses. I think the minimum, I have to count, but I think the minimum amount of time is four hours, but they're arranged between four to five hours of content. Early Irish culture and society covers like pretty much everything you'd need to know about um, early Irish culture and society. Uh, we have a section there, uh, a course, should I say, on Irish mythology as well. So any of you who are interested in that side of things are storytellers and just having a deeper understanding of Irish mythology, you're going to get a lot out of that course. And um, also check out my video here on YouTube, The Psychology of the Irish Gods and Goddesses, Gaelic Gods and Goddesses, um, just to give you a taste of the sort of content that I cover in that course. But I think the jewel in the crown of all of this is the Brehan, uh, the Brehan Laws of Early Ireland course. I don't think there's anything else like this available online. At least I have never found it. And my goal behind these courses was really to make resources that I wished existed when I started researching the Brehan Law more than 10 years ago. So that was really the ambition behind these courses was to build the resources that I think um, others would really benefit from to take this wisdom of early Ireland and to put it into a modern medium, to put it into 
easily digestible videos with nice images and uh, images and graphics to help fuel the imagination and the learning experience. Um, so yeah, if you want to go deeper into the sort of content that I'm covering here, I would recommend, obviously I recommend uh, to check out the online courses on brehenacademy.org. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here on this journey with me. I really appreciate it. Uh, until next time, Slonga Fall. <laughs>